All right. So the the headline feature of web components, as we've talked about, is defining your own custom elements. And one of the things that you can actually do is extend existing elements. So it's not just a question of like defining a totally new thing. You can actually um, extend an existing element and you can think of that sort of like class inheritance. So you know if you've done much programming at all I'm sure you're familiar with object-oriented programming and class inheritance where you have one class that inherits from another class. Since JavaScript doesn't have class inheritance, but has prototype inheritance, I'm switching over to Ruby here because that's my favorite language. Um, so you know you have like an, an animal class, and then you have specific subclasses of that animal that behave differently. So you know you have a dog that when you call it, it comes running, and you have a cat that you call it, and nothing happens. Um, <laughs> And so, you know, inheritance is used when you have a relationship where A is a B. So a dog is an animal, and you should only ever use inheritance when you have that relationship, when you can, like, accurately say, this is this other thing. So, it, like, inheritance is all about getting more specific and doing a specific implementation of a more generic type. Um, and then sort of the other way to bring things together is composition. So if you're not doing inheritance, you're composing things. And like composing things is what you do just by default all the time. That's like what HTML is. You're composing a bunch of different elements into a page. If you're defining your own custom element with Polymer, you are composing the shadow DOM for that element. So you know the 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 reason that composition works so well in Polymer is that you have this template tag where you define the shadow DOM for your element. And even though you have two things here, you know, you have a button and then you have a paragraph tag in your HTML source, when you actually use this element, all you're going to see is the single element that you define. So you're composing multiple things into a single thing. Um, and that might sound a little bit confusing. Um, but the reality is, and like I'm just, I just like this is a talk about extending elements. But for the most part, when you're building with web components, composition is going to be better than inheritance. Most of the time, you're not going to want to extend elements. Instead, you're going to want to create a new element that uses other custom elements inside of it to achieve your goals. But there are some times when you do want to extend elements, and that's sort of what I want to talk about today. So there's two main cases uh, that I've found so far where you want to extend versus using composition. Um, one is when you want to make, like I said, a very a specific implementation of a more generic type. Um, and the reason that you want to use extend, it, it, the reason that you want to use inheritance versus composition here is that there are some elements that have just a ton of different attributes, a ton of different ways that you can configure it. And if you're just trying to create sort of a slightly more specific version of that that's tailored for your application, for example, um, if you use composition, then you're going to have to like do a ton of message passing. So you're going to have to pass like every single one of those attributes through to the other one. Whereas if you use inheritance, you get all of that by default. You inherit all of those attributes. And then the only thing you have to define is how is this different from that? Um, the other time that you might want to extend an element is when you need to work with native elements. So if you want to create a special version of an input tag or a special version of a button tag or any of the other native like non-custom elements, uh, the way that you do that is by extending it and then you use this special is syntax, which actually I didn't do a slide for, but it's in here somewhere. Uh, so Basically, if you use the is syntax, you use the like native element name, so time, div, you know, image, whatever, and then you say is, and then the custom element that you want it to behave as that you defined, which is like that, that's that's very readable. Like it makes a lot of sense. It's like okay, this time isn't just a time. This is a you know string format time. Um, so that's the other time that you're going to want to use inheritance because there's no other way to do it. So if you want to extend an element using Polymer, uh, basically you just use, when you define your element, you just say extends, and then you point to the element that you want it to extend. 
So that's pretty easy. Um, oh wait, actually I've fast forwarded here. There we go. Um, so let's say that I have a cool element and this is, I'm actually like, I realize now that for the purposes of like making a funny demo, I violated my own principle because you can't say that an uncool element is a cool element. So I was being a little too uh, clever, too clever by half for this one, but that's all right. Um, so like, let's say we have a cool element that has a name and then it just says name is so cool. Uh, and then we have an uncool element that extends that cool element and then just says not. Um, so the, the, the point of this example is that the shadow tag will is an insertion point for the parent element's shadow DOM. So anything that you define in the template here will be inserted in the child element wherever you use this shadow tag. Um, so that's how you can sort of layer things on top of each other and make use of you know multiple layers of shadow DOM. I haven't played with this a whole ton, uh, so I don't know like will it work if X? I don't know. Uh, like if you extend an input, can you use shadow to like get the little input box and then put a label next to it? I don't know. I haven't tried it yet. So give it a try and let me know. Um, so yeah, shadow brings in the parent shadow DOM. And then uh, from the JavaScript side, Polymer gives you a super function, which is really nice to have because you can call the uh, parent elements version of a method. Uh, so here we have an example of a parent and a child element. And the parent element has a do something method that takes three arguments, A, B, and C. And then the child has a do something method as well. Uh, at, oh, sh this is wrong. This should actually be this.super. So it's not just super, it's this.super. Um, but this.super basically calls through to the parent elements thing. Um, and it takes, it doesn't take arguments typically. So if I took A, B, and C here, I wouldn't pass like super A comma B comma C. Instead, I would want to pass an array of A comma B comma C because, and that's basically because they wanted to give you this super so that you could just pass arguments and that would automatically pass through all the arguments that were passed to the method because that's how JavaScript works. Um, yeah, so this is another thing that you can do. So if you want to like alter the behavior or do any of the other things that you typically do with inheritance where you want to like either call the super before or after and do some stuff before or you know in the middle or alter arguments, uh, you can do that using the super method. Um, so I have a couple examples one example for sort of each of these that I hope gives you a decent idea of like why you might want to use it. So the first one, uh, this is like the most useful thing that I've found to do with extending elements because as I've actually started building applications with Polymer, one of the things that I realize is like you have these really powerful utility elements that like Polymer gives you. One of them is core Ajax. And so core Ajax lets you just structure an Ajax request but if I'm building something that connects to like a specific API or my application, then like I have some basic setup that I'm going to want to do every single time that I make an API call to my application. So here I wrote, since the GitHub API is awesome and has um, publicly accessible uh, cores so that you can just call through to it, I made a GitHub request element that extends core Ajax um, so how core, core Ajax typically works, since a lot of you are new, uh, basically you have, let me make this a little bigger. And make this a little bigger. Okay. So typically how core Ajax works is you write a core Ajax element and you say a URL that you want it to go to. So example.com, uh, you give it a method, you, uh, if you want it to handle the response as JSON and automatically parse it, you say handle as JSON, uh, you can make it automatically go and all of those sorts of things. Uh, core Ajax is super awesome and it, at first it'll feel really weird to be making Ajax requests with an HTML element, but then <laughs> you'll actually use it a couple times and you'll be like, this is really fantastic. Um, so what I'm doing here is I'm extending core Ajax and I'm saying, what if I just want to make a request to the GitHub API? What if I want a specific version of core Ajax that's tailored to that? So in this case, we already know what we want the uh, domain and everything like that to be. Uh, and I'm making it configurable here because 
this is just something that I do on my own. Like when I'm connecting to my own APIs, if I want to be able to connect to st staging or some other server that's not my like production server, I always have it default to production, but have it configurable so that I can change it if I need to. Um, so you can specify the origin and the path. And then the path is just the path on api.github.com in this case. Um, the other thing that we're doing here is we are speci specifying by default that this is going to be handled as JSON. So without having to configure that in every single element that we use, that's made automatic. Um, and so basically, we added these two new attributes, path and origin, and we are using observe. Uh, so just real quickly, since a lot of you are new to Polymer, <coughs> when you have attributes that you declare, there are a few different ways to sort of take a look at like what happens when they're changed. One would be to say path change and just define a function. Um, so I could say path change, I could say origin change, but since I want them both to run the same function when they change, then I'm going to use observe, which lets you then say I want to observe the origin attribute and when that happens I want to call the update URL method. I want to observe the path and call the same update URL method. And then update URL, all that does is just say this.url, which is the default core Ajax attribute, is equal to the origin plus the path. So basically what that lets me do then in my demonstration here is I have a GitHub request and I say path is slash user slash div shot and then I bind the response that I get to user um, and I also use the auto tag which tells it to just automatically run the request whenever any of the attributes change. Uh, that's again the core Ajax feature. And so now um, I get like I have a specific tailored element for doing requests to the GitHub API and it's like almost no code but this is like really useful to have and you could then you know further ex like one of the reasons like this is useful for something very public and easy like this but if you're doing your own sort of API you might have like an authorization header that you want to send along with every request you might have other configuration that you need to do to every request and by extending the core Ajax element you're able to do that. So this is, like I said, when you want to create like a specific tailored purpose-driven version of a generic element, extending is one way to do that. All right, so the other demo that we're going to do is a string format time. So this one, I forgot just how large the like string, the stirf time function for JavaScript is. So all of this is just a copy and pasted like stirf time function that I found online. So it, none of that matters, uh, but it's there. Uh, and that, all that does is give us the uh, date.stirf time method. But in this case, uh, are, you familiar, are you all familiar with the time element? So time is an HTML5 element that they introduced to give you a semantic way to put a machine readable time in your uh, in your HTML document while also having a human readable version. So the reason that you might want to do that is so that you know if you have a, you know if a web scraper is coming along and you have a time thing, it looks at this date time attribute, which is a an ISO formatted date string, and it's able to parse that out. Whereas, you know, in the actual element itself, you can put whatever you want. You might want to put, you know, next Monday at two p.m. Whereas the date time attribute will have the actual, you know, fully declared date. So what I thought would be fun is to make a custom element by extending the time element that lets us just dis decide on a format that using the stirf time formatting that we want to display for the time. So all we do here is we give it its own shadow DOM template and all we're going to do is um, display the formatted time property and then we define the element with a oops this doesn't need name actually so get rid of that. So we have date time and format and date time is actually built into time uh, but the reason that I add it here is because in order to get the automatic polymer hooks for like observing changes and things like that, you need to explicitly declare it. So this doesn't undo anything that the, like the native date time function does, which actually it doesn't do anything. It's just a standard for like a machine readable attribute. Um, it doesn't undo anything that's already there, but it does let us 
hook into like when it's changed. So I have date time change, and when that happens, I just set the formatted time to parsing the date from the date time attribute and then formatting the time according to the format that I specify. And so here in the demo, you can see that I have a format specified, and if I wanted to change this to something else, I could say, you know, month, day, year, and you see that changes in the representation. So I have a question. I, I never got, I mean, you may have explained it, but I, I may have missed it. What's that polymer function that's right in the middle of the script? Okay, and yeah. So I see a lot of that. Is that like how you access? So that's basically, um, the, the polymer element is a wrapper that's basically saying, like, I'm defining an element now, and I'm going to maybe or maybe not provide a template and maybe or maybe not provide a script tag inside that's going to define right, the element. Right, you can do the no script. Tag, right, you right. can do no script and then you don't need a script yeah. tag inside. Um, but like this is basically you declaring your custom element definition. So actually I'll try this out right now because I've seen it like they've gone back and forth on whether this is okay. Yeah, this is actually okay. So this is basically you just saying like I'm going to define an element now and if it's inside the polymer element declaration, you don't actually need the attribute's name there. But you could also do this, excuse me, outside of a polymer element tag, and then you would need to explicitly say the name of the element that you're declaring. So this is just this is just a wrapper over the native um, custom element definition library yeah. that's something like document, like create element, or, or it's not document doc, create element, but it's something along those lines. Right. Uh, there's a native way to create an element, and this is just like the Polymer streamlined way to create an element. So that's all that is. All right. uh, any other questions? Cool, so that is extending elements for fun and profit. Thank you.